Hello everyone, welcome to SMG Hangouts. I'm your host, Mike Valente, and I'm here with Canadian sports journalist, reporter, and hockey insider, Elliot Friedman. Elliot, it is a pleasure to talk to you. How are you? Good to be here, Mike. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. We're not used to seeing you with the beard. Mm -hmm. I think it suits you. What, what do you think? Well, you know, I like it. My kid likes it. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure my wife's so crazy about it. Right. Um, but, you know, in this business, wives are used to us making them hate you. So that's that's no problem. <laughs> so um, we're starting on an uplifting yeah, note. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> we get along okay. <laughs> you know what? In the summer, Roger's good. Like from, um, from Labor Day until July 1st, I'm on the clock. Right. That's like right. You basically are 24-7. You're not always there, mm -hmm. but you're available. And uh, they're really good about saying in the summer, you don't have to say yes to anything. That's great. So from the day we, the time we sign off on July 1st free agency until Labor Day, I don't shave <laughs> unless there's a really good reason for it. I love that though, right? Because during the season, as you just mentioned, it, it would be impossible almost for your job to unplug with everything on social media, new media, you know, in addition to your sports net and hockey night duties, you're constantly on Twitter, right? You've got yep. the podcast, 31 Thoughts and yep. the blog. So during the time of the season, how do you manage your time at all? Like, do you have enough time in the day to do stuff with your family and for yourself? Well, actually, it's, 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 it's funny because one of the things, Mike, I did this summer was my son went to day camp. He's seven years old. He went to day camp in uh, July. And I got up every morning to take him to the bus, and I made sure I was there every day to take him home unless I really had somewhere I needed to be. And those are the kinds of dad things I can't always do during the season. Mm -hmm. The good thing about my job is that aside from when I'm on TV, I really set my own hours. Um, you know, I don't have to go into work. I'm allowed to work out of my home office. I only go into work when I'm on TV or we're taping the podcast or right. if I have to go in to tape a hit if something big happens. Um, otherwise, I'm home, so I can take my kid to school here and there. But there's a lot of things. There's no question I'm distracted. Yeah. Like, I get a lot of, are you listening to me talks, like, uh, at home during the year? Right. Um, you know, so basically, you're constantly, am I missing? anything am I on top of things and our job we're expected to be on top of things right so you're always there and if you know if you report something then you got to keep following on the story and if someone else reports it you've got to keep following the story so you are distracted during the year I'm on social media way too much I do know that when the day comes I leave the business whether I'm fired or I retire I am burning all of my social media I am gonna become a ghost and no one is ever gonna see me again I, I don't blame you for that I don't blame you I wanted to ask you about your early days yep. at hockey night uh, specifically you started there in 2003 yeah 15 years which yep. is crazy that's fantastic when it first began like do you recall how you were hired like did yep. you have to audition were you yep. recruited how did that all happen for you well if you go back to 2003 um, at the end of that season, the Stanley Cup final it was uh, Anaheim versus New Jersey, and I, I was covering that for the score at the time. And um, my and uh, I didn't see the final broadcast, but somebody told me about it. Game seven, uh, New Jersey won the Stanley Cup, three nothing over Anaheim. And Hockey Night in Canada had a guy who was their number two host behind Ron at the time. His name was Scott Russell. And I guess at the end of the broadcast, he gave a passionate speech saying he was leaving and he was going to go do other projects. Scott, uh, I don't know anybody who cares more about the Olympics That's and right. amateur athletics more than Scott Russell, and, he, and they created a role for him doing that. Mm -hmm. And so Scott, um, he left Hockey Night, and there was an opening. And, you know, I'm a kind of guy, and, and everybody's different. Like, I've met people who are real go-getters. I don't think there's anything wrong with being a real go-getter. I think you have to decide what fits yourself. And there are some people, like, they see a job opening, and they're like, I'm going for it. Like, that's mine. I'm yeah. going for it. And when you're starting out, as many of you are, that's the way I would advise you to be. But as I got older and I got more into my career, I became like the kind of guy, I like to be low maintenance. Um, I was like, if somebody wants me, they'll come find me. Hmm. And that's kind of what happened with Hockey Night. I didn't apply for the job. And then, so that was in June when he signed off. And in September, I got a call from someone who was a senior producer at Hockey Night. And, you know, he said, he, his name is Shirelli Najak. And he said, you know, you haven't applied for the job. And I told him that. I said, I'm a big believer now that I was a little older. If someone finds me, wants me, they'll come find me. And he said, look, I'm not offering you the job, but I want you to apply for the job. Hmm. And uh, so I did, I applied for the job and I, I got an interview. And at CBC, the way they do interviews is they, they have what's called a board. There were four people in the room interviewing me. 
and one of the people was from uh, Human Resources. Mm. And the only question she asked me was, um, uh, do you have a temper? And I said, uh, yeah, I do, but it's usually directed only at myself. Like if I make a mistake, I like there was one story I told about where I made a mistake in a story and I punched an $800 hole in my apartment wall. <laughs> and later they told me after I got hired, like the next time someone from Human Resources asks you if you have a temper, don't give that answer. <laughs> Just don't get into it. <laughs> Say no. So that's a piece of advice for all of you. So I went through that one interview and then they called me back and uh, they asked me for a second interview. And I guess they, of the hundreds of applicants, there were eight people in the first round and there were three in the second. Wow. And so that second interview was on a Saturday and two days later was Curtis Joseph's first day at Detroit Red Wings camp. It was on a Monday. So on the Sunday, we drove to um, Traverse City, Michigan, about seven hours. And on the Monday, we went and covered his first day of camp and we were going back to file the story. And I got a call from the guy at that time, Joel Darling, who was the executive producer of Hockey Night in Canada. And he said, Elliot, uh, I, we wanted to get back to you today, but we're working on some things, finalizing some things, and, and we'll get back to you later. Mm -hmm. And I thought that meant that I was like the runner up, that they were trying to talk to somebody and, and see if they could get a contract done oh, with okay. that person. Right. And, I, and I was the fallback. Yeah, if, yeah. And then he called me back 30 minutes later and he said, Elliot, you know, we had a conversation and uh, it's not your fault that some of these things are being delayed. So we just want to tell you that we want to bring you aboard and we want to start negotiating a contract with you. And I remember I was driving with my cameraman at the score at the time and he was driving and I was the passenger. And I was surprised. I didn't think I was going to get the job. And I almost knocked us off the road. Like I wasn't even driving. I, I did something and I knocked him. Yeah. I remember we were on a two lane highway, one right. way, one way, and we were going that way. We we're on the right side. And uh, I almost knocked us into the ditch. That's how I got hired. Oh God. Wow. And the funniest thing was we had the, uh, this story. I'm not going to give more, but okay. initially with the contract, it was, it was tough. Like yeah. uh, they, they were, they were like, you're a hockey night now. Like right. some of it's the honor of hockey night. And they were, they were tough negotiators. Right. Yeah. The, the hometown discount, yeah, so to they, speak. They were yes. tough negotiators, yeah, yeah. but it was great. For sure. And what about your first national on-air broadcast? Do you remember? I do remember that. You know, it's funny. I just listened to a Malcolm Gladwell podcast about memory and how you can't trust memory. And I believe a lot of that to be true. But these ones, I, I think I remember like they were yesterday. Yeah. My first, I don't remember the date. I, um, it was October 2003. It was a Thursday night. We opened with a Thursday night game okay. yep. uh, between uh, Montreal and Ottawa in Ottawa. Okay. And Martin Havlat was playing for the Senators at the time. He didn't have a contract yet. He was going to miss the opening of the season. And we went on air at 7 o'clock. And at 7.02, I was going to interview John Muckler about Havlat, who was then the GM right. of the senators and um, he uh, looked at me at seven o'clock as the, and then we still had the old music then that dun, dun, yeah. dun, dun, dun. Right. and I heard it come on in my earpiece and I was like freezing I froze I was like what the hell am I doing here like I cannot believe I'm here yeah and I was nervous I don't get nervous very often but I, I was nervous then and uh, I turned to Muckler, who'd seen everything, and I said, I bet you this is the only time the reporter's more, in, more nervous in the interview than you are. And he looked at me and said, I doubt it. And that oh, broke the ice. Okay. And then yeah. I was fine. But I, I do remember my first game. Everybody thinks your first game's a Leaf game. It's not. It was yeah, yeah. Ottawa, Montreal, and I believe Ottawa killed them last night, that night, something like 5-2. to two. There you go. Yeah. So we mentioned 15 years now at Hockey Night in Canada. Yeah. How would you say you've changed as a broadcaster throughout the years? Because I have to imagine the first few years at Hockey Night, you're trying to find your rhythm, trying to get more comfortable. So were you working on certain things? You know, at the beginning of Hockey Night, my, I, I, was, I was overly careful for years when I got to Hockey Night because Hockey Night's got so much history and I was like, don't yeah. screw it up, right. Right? don't be yeah. the guy who screws it up. Mm -hmm. So I remember my first couple of years, I was very careful and I didn't uh, step on a lot of toes. You know, one thing I did push was, you know, uh, I, I believe that the sideline reporter role has been, generally in sports, has not been used as well as it could be. And I wanted to push to be on air more. Not because I had a huge ego, I wanted to be on air, but I wanted to show that that sideline reporter role had a lot to offer. Yep, yep. And he was, and, and our, my producer was very appreciative of that. He, he challenged me. He would say, you have to have five things on air that are new. And we might not get to them. But it became to the point where he would always say to me, like, what... Yeah, I'd come with five or six things and he'd say, okay, um, what if 
you can only get on air twice. Like, what are the things you have to get on air tonight that you feel really strongly about? Yeah. So, and there, there would be nights. There weren't too many. But I remember there was one night I only got on twice, and that was the two between periods interviews. And he came to me after. He said, look, I apologize. You didn't get on a lot. And I was like, don't worry about it. Like, you had a jam. Like, it was just every time they came to me, something happened during the game. Right, yeah. And I was good about that. But I wanted to, the one thing I wanted to do is I really wanted to push the sideline reporter role and make it, uh, better. The other thing I think I've changed it is that when I was at the score, they wanted me to be an anchor, and I was like, I don't want to be an anchor. I just want to be in the field. I find the desk too boring. Mm-hmm. When I was at CBC, I started over, and they really challenged me. Mm-hmm. Like they were like, you're new here, and you're and you don't have the power you have at the score. Yeah, you're gonna do what we want you to do. And I remember my first Olympics, they said to me, um, you're gonna do various. Like you're not getting a sport. So, okay, I didn't know what that was. I was new. It was my first Olympics. And they were like, my various was, they said, we're giving you four sports to be in charge of. uh, Table tennis, tennis, badminton, and weightlifting. And it was their way of saying, can you do this? Yeah. And I I think the thing that changed was they pushed me out of my comfort zone and they made me do different things. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed that. I think it made me better. No, absolutely, for sure. Uh, Something you've said on your podcast before is... Uh, something to the effect when we talk about the business, will I regret this when I'm 50? Yes. And I, and I do think that's kind of a great motto, especially for younger broadcasters, to kind of navigate your career by, right? So maybe You know, Mike, it's so funny you say that because as you ask me that question, I'm thinking I'm about to turn 48. Like, I, I'm getting really, I'm really getting close to this. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just something I always tell young people. I, I just tell young people that, I, I know when you're young, you don't like to think of life when you're older, and I get that. Nobody wants to think about being old like I am getting. Um, but I, I, that was something I, I really lived with my, uh, uh, that was something I really drove. I said, I don't ever want to be in a position where I look back at something uh, when I'm 50 or when I croak and say, boy, I really regret that I didn't do that. Like, um, I, I worked hard. I didn't really travel until my 30s. I, I said during my 20s, I'm going to work. And I worked every summer, and there were times other people went and, I, and had fun, and I passed up on that. Um, I gave up some trips with buddies. I, you know, I, I had the opportunity to become like even like a better golfer. I, I didn't do any of that. I was all like, I'm gonna go like just straight through work, and I don't regret it because it got me to where even farther than I wanted to go. I never imagined I would be sitting uh, uh, here in this chair with you talking about the career I've had, good and bad. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't have ever imagined it. Um, so I'm a big believer that some of the advice I, w- I would give you guys is that, uh, you know, if you really want to be, there was someone, there was a, my, my sister had a friend and she was really, in, she's really into sports. When she was about 23, she said to me, I really want to get into sports journalism or reporting, but I only want to work Monday to Friday, nine to five. And I told her, don't, don't do it. Like, if th- this is an evening and weekends job and there's a lot of extra time. If you really want to be good, you're going to have to take a chance and do some things that you're not going to get paid properly for. Mm-hmm. And uh, I told her, get out. And I would tell all of you that. If, you know, it, it's like anything else in life. If you're not going to be successful at anything if you go the extra mile. So if you really want to do this or you really want to do anything, you have to be prepared to sacrifice things and uh, say, whatever's between this and my end goal, um, I'm going to do whatever I can to blast through it. Because if you don't, you're not going to be successful. So no, that's sure. why I said nothing yeah. you regret when you're 50. As a journalist and a reporter and an insider, I'm curious about your early days as well when you're, you're trying to build those relationships with general managers and owners of teams and coaches. For someone starting out, that must be a little tough to kind of create those relationships and have that connection. It is, but I I didn't really think about it, Mike, when I look back, because I've been asked that question a lot, like, how do you do that? And like, when you first start out, what do you do? And I think it helped that when I first started out, I was more of a reporter and I wasn't, like, there was no real insider back then when I started. And just to give you guys like a timeline, I, I always make clear this. I never graduated university. I'm a credit and a half shy. Uh, I am going to finish it someday, but it's, it's a Shakespearean English, which is four essays and two exams, and it's an algebra. And who wants to take either one of those courses? I don't blame so you for putting that on. I'm trying to psych up myself to finish it. When I left school in 93, there weren't really any insiders. They were just reporters and whatever everyone else did. 
And um, so I wasn't expected to break a lot of stuff. It was always a bonus if you did, but you, it wasn't as expected of you then as it is now. And uh, you know, what happens is FaceTime. Like you're just there every day. Um, you know, you're, if you're there every day, like I covered the Raptors when they first came in and I don't know how many of those guys knew my name, but they all knew who I was. I was at every game, I was at every practice, I was asking questions. You know, I, was, I always tried to be professional. I didn't ask anyone for anything. I just, you know, here's my question, give me your answer. And, you know, like, if you are a professional and you treat people well, um, people treat you well generally. I mean, there's always some asshole who's different than everyone else, but uh, I think that most people, if you treat them well, they will treat you well. And the greatest thing about that first Raptors team is, you know, I'm a white middle-class Jewish guy from Toronto, and there were a lot of guys who on that team, well, nobody on that team had the same background. A lot of them were uh, African Americans from the United States. Uh, there were some Europeans, but there were, a lot, but there was nobody who had a comparable background to me. And a lot of them came from really, really tough times. But the one thing I really learned is it doesn't matter where you come from. If you're willing to be civil to each other and you're willing to uh, be respectful of other people's time and space, you can build an understanding. Like. I remember uh, when Damon Stoudemire was traded, the first time he came back, he came back with the Portland Trailblazers. He walked up to me and he goes, hey, Elliot, I saw you at the World Series last year. I was like, first of all, what are you doing watching me at the World Series? And secondly, Damon, you were here for almost three years. I never even know you knew my name. He goes, I didn't need to know your name. Your face was, you're there every day. Oh. And I, I, I just remember that because I'm not like a huge egomaniac or anything like that. But, I under, but that taught me about the impact of what you do. Because first of all, the teams are always paying attention because it's their job to know how you're portraying their athletes and their people. Because if they feel it's unfair, they're gonna tell you they think it's unfair. Um, and you know what, family and friends watch a lot. Like I remember there was one time uh, a player's wife wrote to me in hockey about how it sucked to hear her husband's name in trade rumors and stuff. So I said, you know what? I'm going to be at the game the such and such night. Why don't we meet during an intermission and we can talk about it and I can write something. And she was, she was great. I'd love to. And uh, so they came out of the elevator and the other, all three, she came down with three other wives slash girlfriends and they got out first and they all pointed to me. And I was like, okay, everybody here knows who I am. Not because I'm some big star. It's because of the platform I had. And, um, and I think that's the thing that you really realize is that people are watching. And if you do a good job and you're there every day, people trust you. And if they don't feel you do a good job, then they don't trust you. And that affects, Mike, your ability to build sources and people. You know, you can be critical as long as you're critical and fair. Right. It's when you're critical or intentionally that's yeah. when the problems start. Yeah. But you know what? Like I always say, like one thing I've learned is I'm not afraid to do that, but I really believe in saving your bullets. Like if you do it all the time, it loses effectiveness. If you don't do a lot and then you do it, it's effective. For sure. We really appreciate your insight, to Elliot. So thanks very much for doing this. And I think the beard looks good. <laughs> thanks very much, Mike. I hope I didn't drone on too long. Yeah, no, no, absolutely not. Elliot Friedman, everybody, with a beard on SMG.